Welcome to the VoxGig podcast. We talk to people in the developer community about developer relations, public speaking, and community events. For more details, visit voxgig.com slash podcast. All right, let's get started. In developer relations, we often talk about the three C's, code, community, and content. But how do we bring that all together? Because really what we're offering to our users, who are developers, is a service. And surely we should design that service properly. My talk today is with John Lynch, uh, the founder of Context Studio. And what they do is service design, which is an all-encompassing approach to delivering a service to your users. John, of course, has worked in Denmark. He might have picked up a few things about design there. He is also on the board of the Institute of Designers in Ireland, so he kind of knows his stuff. We have a really, really interesting discussion about how you can use service design principles to guide the implementation and execution of your developer relations strategy. So if you want to know how to make your code, community, and content coherent, well, John Lynch is the man to listen to. John, it is great to have you here today on the Fireside with Box Gig podcast, talking about design and getting developers to understand design and the importance of design. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, it's great to be here. Awesome. Just to set some context, and you'll see why I use the word context in a bit. Um, to set some context, uh, developer relations is the thing we're talking about. Um, and we've asked you to, to come on board to talk a little bit about how to integrate design thinking into developer relations, because as a developer, and you, you were a developer once, so you'll understand mm -hmm. this experience as well. Uh, a lot of our jobs these days are integrating third-party services, mm -hmm. working with APIs, working with SDKs, trying to read documentation. Uh, and our experience as developers of that process and of third-party services as a service is pretty painful. Uh, and we've all seen uh, what, that when Stripe came along and had a really, really big focus on design and on developer experience, um, that it was a core element of their success. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's our topic today. Uh, but first, I think uh, just for our audience, uh, it might be interesting to understand a little bit about your business and what you actually do, um, because it's it's broader than just design for websites. That's right, and I'm glad and I'm glad you said that because I usually have to to start with saying it's broader than just design for websites. Um, so Context Studio is based in Dublin. We're about four years old, and I founded the company with the goal of bringing the impact that I saw design have in other economies back home, because I'm originally from, from Ireland, um, and we do service design. Um, people ask me, without, like, without fail, they ask, what is that? Um, and what I like to say is it's, it's aligning, and making sure you understand not just your customer experience, which I tend to talk about as, as UX, it's what people are using on the front end of your service, but also how you design the backstage services that enable that experience. Um, and I suppose the chat we had um, well, just before we came on is, is that if you walk into a, into, a, into a shop and someone on the, on the staff pays no attention to you whatsoever, and then when you finish your transaction, they like throw the receipt at you, it's not necessarily because they're a bad person, but maybe the service hasn't been designed to enable them to fulfill the needs that that service requires. So. We do a lot of research in understanding the, the context, hence the name, um, of, of the ways in which services are delivered. And we do, then we build the innovation within that service with the teams across the board so that everybody gets their perspective shared. And, and then the last piece is, and this is key to design is prototype. You know, developers love a good prototype, um, but to test at low cost with small numbers, make sure things are taken over and then scale because the one day fun thing characterizes services, which I think we might come back to, is um is how quickly they scale sometimes. Yeah, and I think you're I think, I think it's important to note, right, that the um the quality of service delivery as a developer when you're buying coffee is as important as the quality of service delivery when you're using an API. 
Both oh, are essential to getting code out the door. Well, you, yeah, you wouldn't get the code out the door maybe without the coffee. Exactly. I think I think that question of scale is important because when you talk about building building services based on services, you suddenly have an exponential problem if there are issues there in terms of the quality of experience to deploy those services because you have stacks and an issue with one micro API service that's providing um, a, a building block for 12 or 14 other you end up with millions of people having terrible experiences as a result. So it's becoming more and more important because of that exponential uh, possibility. Yeah, I mean, just, just to frame it from my personal experience as a developer, building things for people and relying on third-party APIs, uh, the ones that are well-documented, the ones that are reliable in the sense that um, I can get good support, Mm -hmm. are going to get my recommendation to the client rather than ones that, that um, you know, where it's clear that the developers themselves are not that important. It's like, oh, here's badly written documentation, off you go. Um, or, oh, whoops, you know, there was downtime again, but we're not going to admit it and it doesn't mm -hmm. appear on the status page. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's, try and, let's try and put some structure on how you approach things, though. Do, do you have a a framework or a set of frameworks that are used. So walk me through. I'm setting up a coffee shop. <laughs> let's let's yeah. have a coffee shop example. Uh, and I come to you. And okay, it's a high-end coffee shop, right? We're talking 3FE or you know, even worse in terms of coffee. <laughs> um, this is my dream, right? I've sold my startup and I want to do coffee shops. Go uh, for it. Which I may well do. Uh, what framework do you use to approach that? How do you design that service? Um, well, th to be honest, the coffee shop is a bit of a tired example in the service design world. Um, it's yeah. the one everybody goes to because we are our own yeah. filter bubble. Um, but leaving it behind a little bit, you can look across all services. And it's it's important to ask yourself, what defines a service? And my best uh, baseline for that is a, a number of interactions that happen. And I hope you're a Star Trek fan, um, but a number of interactions that happen over space and time. Very good. Um, and what that means is like sometimes we sign up for a service as early as when we're born. Um, like I I remember I, I lived in Denmark for four years and I remember someone, a, a migrant like me telling me, you know, when you have a child here, they give you your social security number the moment the baby's born. And you're in, you're then part of a lifetime of service use. Um, sometimes we, we, we experience those things over 40, 50, 80, 90 years and in lots of different places. Other times it's. I'm on holiday and I, I'm experiencing a service in the world of tech. You know, you sign up for a service online. I got my 14 year anniversary of Twitter tweet yesterday wow. um, and they can be very elongated and, and, and you change over time. It's true of developers, too. So the first thing service design tries to do is understand that ecosystem of interactions over time, where they're happening, when they're happening and why they're happening. And we do that through research. We do it through talking to people, through looking at data. A lot of mapping and visualization is involved because one thing that also characterizes services, is they're never delivered by one person. Um, there's always, in the case of, of technology, there's business analysts, there's engineers, there's designers, there's data analytics people, there's software developers. Maybe there's two teams of software developers, one for Android, one for iOS. Um, and what we, we, we need to do is is align all those people about what is the best model we can build of what's happening. And that's what mapping helps us do. So um, research, mapping, and then we, in, we start using things like co-creation and ideation to ensure that everybody's ideas, we, we, we use the creativity, the creativity across all the talent to come up with the, the potential solutions. And in the case of APIs and, and, and documentation, Sometimes it's as simple as raising the bar from it works to it works for more people. Um, and th that's what that framework allows you to do because you understand who's using it, where they're using it, what they're looking for. And then you get the ideas out on a, in a format everyone understands, which helps everyone's solution together um, in order to, to, to find the way forward. And then the last piece of that framework, Richard, is, is, is prototype. So rather than just writing the doc and lashing it into the documentation to put it in front of some people who are your users and say, 
does this work for you? And use uh, methods that ensure you're getting real feedback from those people. So you can change it quickly before it scales. Um, so that would be sort of a summary uh, while, while, while the coffee is still on the brew. <laughs> it's kind of, it sounds like it's a, it's a process that needs to run continuously. That's, that's absolutely true. So one of the things I try to do with every project we engage, we, we like to try and do, a, sometimes we literally do live learning work where we join a team and work with them on a problem in the hopes that when we leave, they are the service design mindset exemplar. Um, but we always try, no matter what the work is, to, to ensure that when we're gone, the team can continue to do that iterative process. And there's lots of overlap here with, Agile um, and and things that developers are really really um, familiar with, you know. Um, but it, it services never end, and therefore service design never stops because you kind of there's a great uh, allow me to just indulge for a moment. But there's a great quote from Jeff Bezos from the launch day of the Kindle, which I think was 2012, and he's launching a gadget. But he said people don't want gadgets anymore; they want services. They want services that get better every day, every week, every month, every year. Um, and he said that on the day he launched the gadget, which was really strange. But then if you bought a Kindle that day, it's better now because you've got so many more services that it's the window too. I never, yeah, that's interesting. I never knew you said that. It ties in with something else that happened at Amazon years ago. Um, and it's strange to be talking about Jeff Bezos as the poster boy for design thinking. Uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of, usually, usually it's the other fellow. Um, but uh, part of the reason that Amazon Web Services has, are so successful is a hardline decree uh, that Bezos made years and years ago that everything had to be every oh, all the internal technical capabilities had to be delivered as services that could be exposed to the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a very, there's actually a very famous article about it, an internal memo that got exposed by accident by a guy called Steve Yegi. It's kind of quite famous in developer circles, but um, okay. that simple decree, I'll send it to you, that simple decree, and we'll post it in the notes as well, that simple decree um, ultimately led to Amazon Web Services. Now, don't get me started on the developer experience of <laughs> sure. Amazon Web Services. There are lots and lots of startups making very good money simply providing a well thought out well designed experience layer for amazon <laughs> um but hey you know i suppose that's an ecosystem but that's that's true too of of you know this is not new news uh when you look back at things like sap years ago there was an entire economy built around helping integrate the systems they provided um and the the really large technology consulting firms are the ones who from 2012 onwards were buying service design consultancies all over the world. Like we were, I sat in my own studio when I worked uh, for CAD in Copenhagen and watched the, the news stories come in every three or four months, another service design studio was bought. Um, and it's because they saw the relevance of that, um, yeah. that the framework could assist in helping teams understand services so that services could be improved perpetually using your own reference earlier on it, it doesn't it can't stop you know tell me about denmark because it has kind of a reputation for having <laughs> rather good at design how did you end yeah. up deliberate or it was um it was thanks to a friend uh, uh I, I studied multimedia in dcu and it was a good friend of mine kevin cannon who's now working in design at a startup in germany um called pitch who some people might have heard of kevin uh surfaced a design school in italy um, and said to me one day, we were in our mid-20s, um, and he said to me, you know, we should be looking at the schools like this. And it, the, the school in Italy was called Ivrea. It was sort of the original interaction design school. Um, and they closed and then reopened in Copenhagen under the word, under the name Copenhagen Institute for Interaction Design. And Kevin went off over there. We thought he was mad. Um, I visited saw incredible work being done and immediately was sold. Um, but actually the real the real change was when I moved to Copenhagen. And what you learn is that in the Nordics, um, design is understood as a mindset. Um, it isn't pigeonholed into aesthetics or pixels or fashion. 
but it's understood as a as a way to approach the creation of something new, um, whether it's a solution. Um, although I have a I have a I have a sense that almost all design is a solution to something, um, whether it's a, a need or a want. Um, but they they really do, and it's been the case since the cooperative movements in the in, in Nordic history. I'm not an expert, um, but there's a there's an there's this culture of applying design to make people's lives better, um, as opposed to just selling more things or uh, making things pretty. Um, and it, it it changed my perspective, and I suppose that a real uh, Aha moment for me was our first user research project as a student there, which found me on the streets of Copenhagen in the freezing cold in February. And after that cold winter of 2010, um, talking to heroin users about their experience of the city so that we could report back to the municipality about the user experience of a drug addict around the train station in Copenhagen. Um, and okay. those convers- that was that was deep end stuff. Yeah. Um, really, really amazing experience. and showed me the value having been a software developer all the way up and just building ideas based on what my boss told me. Um, it made me think, oh, hang on a minute, we can learn a lot and eliminate a lot of mistakes by having conversations. Um, and that was a massive pivot for me, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, and a great place to live. Um, and service uh, service design is not maybe recognized in um in the terminology, but you can see it all around you in the way public services work and the way banks deliver their services in the Nordics and, and elsewhere. Yeah, we, we could definitely do with a bit of that. Um, the, I mean, it's, it sounds like there are, there are fundamental assumed mental models that most people have um, that don't exist in, in, in other parts of the world. I wouldn't be so critical as to say they don't exist. Like we are starting to understand, um, and I and I think there's there's good work being done, in particular in education uh, here in Ireland and in the UK. Um, I, I lived in London for two years, and the UK the UK's national government is really great. As there's there's some, I think there's 750 service designers in the UK's Ministry of Justice. Um, I'm pretty sure that was the stat when I when I spoke to the last person I spoke to there last to maybe two years ago. Um, so it's 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 more common than you think. It's just the terminology, like we do ourselves the dis the disservice of of changing the terminology quite frequently. Um, and really, it's about the mindset that underpins it. And for example, the Irish government launched their own design principles for government back in October. Um, there's a real awareness of what I I think the catch all is people centered design, making sure you're meeting the needs of the people who are using a service. Um, and that's. That's that's a moving target. That's we're definitely on the up. So you're seeing changes happening. It is starting to infuse a little bit. Oh, there's there's no doubt. But 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 it's also because it makes business sense. It makes business sense to be able to better connect with your customers in a really competitive marketplace and in a situation where changing a service is becoming so easy. Um, like if you think about the services we experienced like when I was a kid, and you know, to move your bank account was a nightmare, whereas you can open an app now and have a digital bank account with a German bank in a matter of minutes. Um, so yeah, it's becoming yeah. more and more important that that loyalty isn't because of friction, um, but actually is because of a great experience. And loyalty counts. Like if you have a community of developers who are consistently rep- recommending a particular API, a particular service, because it has a great API and documentation, that's not because of their lock-in. Um, we're not looking at a lock-in based relationship um, because that doesn't work anymore. It's very, very easy to find an alternative. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm just trying to pull this all together from the perspective of um, somebody who's, who, whose primary users are developers. They mm-hmm. offer an API of some kind. They have a set of SDKs. Um, a lot of the times what we see in, in our work is, um, you know, the, the, the SDK is built and then that's kind of it. Um, and you might get occasional updates. Um, the documentation is done and then that's it. I mean, that definitely doesn't get updated because sometimes it's very out of date. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're lucky, you get example code. Um, 
if you're lucky, there's some sort of forum, <laughs> and maybe it's on Reddit or Stack Overflow or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the better ones tend to have put effort into the community and support on that level um, and tend to focus on, yeah, community building and running events and that type of stuff. But you can you can clearly feel the difference between companies that treat developer relations as a service, as an ongoing activity versus companies that treat it as a, okay, that's just a fixed part of the product. It's done now. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. um, and it has, and we've got to, as developers, we've got to put up with it for a long time. <laughs> uh, yeah. But going, I mean, going back to Stripe, right, which is my go-to example, we had to put up with really awful payment gateway integrations. Um, and I've, I've done a few. Uh, versus Stripe that applied the design thinking. And it's not just, oh, they had beautiful docs and they have a beautiful website or whatever. It's it's the whole experience. Mm -hmm. uh, even something as simple as um, like API keys and identifier keys in the Stripe system have little prefixes to tell you what sort of key they are. Mm -hmm. And that's a practice that, that I've seen adopted now in, in other services, as opposed to just giving you an opaque GUI, right? You don't know what it is. Yeah. But to come up with that means that they must have applied design thinking, I'm sure. I, I would be absolutely certain they did. And I, I don't know them personally. But what it comes back to for me, Richard, is what you mentioned. That word, it only snuck into your 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 story towards the end is the word product. Um, I think it's, it's the, one of the most abused words. I remember my first bit of dissonance around the word product was when I was working as a cashier at 18 years of age in a bank in Dublin for the summer. And the investment advisor started telling me about products we should sell. And some of them were pensions and some of them were savings accounts. And I was like, they're not products. No, they're services. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But I was an 18 year old summer employee, so I couldn't object. Um, but we, we have an entire world, which has kind of really come to the limelight in the last 10 years, this idea of product. Um, and I worked with product teams, helping them do discovery through service design because that's what the terminology in the product world is but if you start a product company and you have a one and done mentality that you build it write it up and then start taking the money in um that's when your 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 mindset will breed the experience of outdated documentation api keys nobody understands um frustrated users who are only still with you because they're locked in five five years later and they can't you know shift they don't feel like they can get the the buy-in in their organization to try something different um whereas if you start a company that is maybe it calls itself a product company but it is taking the service approach to say look we will have customers they will be customers for a long time and we need to be there for them and also that the world isn't gonna when we launch no one's pressing the pause button on the planet things are going to change and no one's pressing the pause button on the internet things are going to change. If we took the same approach to service provision as we do things like security, um, it'd be a very proactive type effort instead of reactive where you spot something that loads of people on a forum are complaining about. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and word, a lot of this is driven by unfortunate word choices because the sort of traditional VC view of startups is that, oh, you can't be selling services. It has to be a product. Services don't scale. So that's that's taken as, as a ground truth in the startup world, the tech mm. startup world. Oh, I have to do a product. Uh, maybe it's time to peel back the layers a bit and say, um, you know, the the... <laughs> the actually get the financial model that the VCs like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the the tail is wagging the dog here because a true product that scales, uh, and it particularly has um, you know uh, a, a very high lifetime value, right? Mm -hmm. LTV is something they really care about. It actually has to be a service. Now, it's not a high, you know, not a not not high touch consultancy, perhaps, but no, a service nonetheless, not a product. Exactly, and it, it it is it's it's a it's a it's a semantics um, problem. I don't think we're going to change the language people use. I don't think we're gonna we're gonna rename the products world the services world. Um, 
but I do think there's something in the mindset that under that 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 is within a, a say a startup or a, or a, or, a um, or any organization that um, they can call themselves a product company, but if there is that that service mindset, um, the product won't mess will probably evolve and. Uh, when you go past, you know, whatever round of funding and you've got whatever number of users, the needs that that service has to meet will change as well. Um, and then separately, there's the external factors like uh, the evolution of uh, new business models on the Internet might mean that the your product's being used. But there's this wonderful diagram, which um, it was created over at CIID, where I studied, I think, but it's the the, the, the stages of the service journey. You know, how do I know something exists how do i learn about whether i want it how do i commit to using it how do i learn how to use it how do i challenge that service and maybe use it for something it wasn't intended for how do i advocate for it how do i quit um and they add that the service design mindset would try to design all of those stages um if something on the internet changes and your service is being challenged that's not a bad thing it could actually be an opportunity and if you're not maintaining your service, you're going to miss that opportunity. So that's that comes back to that perpetuity piece and keeping your research, spotting the opportunities, having the mechanisms to respond. Uh, let's yeah, if 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 you can give us a, a link or something to that that service journey. Oh, well, yeah, I'll try and dig it out. Yeah, dig it out. That'd be super interesting. You know, um, it occurs to me that the term minimal viable product should probably be changed to minimum viable service. Um, uh, I'm not going to get hung up on the, the, <laughs> the I really, I, like I said, I don't think, I think there's an ecosystem there. There's a world that is developing products and that's the language that that world uses. Yeah. What we need to do is talk about the mindset of a product developer. Um, because, you know, you could flip this on its head and I do this quite often with students. If I get the chance to teach, which I still love to do. Um, Look around your house and ask yourself how many services are connected to every single physical product in the room you're standing in. Um, like you can go down. I, I could go downstairs now. I I, I had uh, I'm working from home today. I put a wash on this morning, which we can do. And that washing machine has a support service. Does Zanussi have a yeah, a, yeah. A, a network of technicians? They have a supply chain for parts for that washing machine, and they have a distribution service. They need it to be connected to a water service and to an electricity service. Um, if it was a fancy washing machine, which it isn't, um, it would likely have layers of digital services. There'd be QR codes I could scan. There might even be a Wi-Fi chip inside it that's connected to the internet to know how, to know how best to handle my, my, my new shirt. Um, so in actual fact, this debate between what is a, is it a product or is it a service, what I find more and more often is that it is a service even if it's something you're holding in your hand. Um, so the two the two are actually, it, they're symbiont. Um, it's very unusual now to find a product uh, that doesn't have some services connected with it. This um, We have to wrap up, unfortunately, we've run out of time and we may, we may okay. return to this discussion, but um, you know, a, a lot of the time in this podcast, we, we get into the sort of nuts and bolts of how to run developer relations and manage communities and that type of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But this is really uh, taking us up. This is going meta, right? We're getting philosophical here about it. Is <laughs> you think? How do you think uh, about the gestalt, about the whole thing together? Uh, super interesting. I'm going to have to process it a little bit. I can't wrap it up neatly. I'm afraid. I have to. Okay. <laughs> I have to do some thinking. Uh, but wow, yeah, great. Uh, it's given me a lot to think about. Um, well, thank you so much, John. Fabulous. It's been a real pleasure, and sorry to throw the cat among the pigeons a little bit, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we're here for. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Emil. Take care. You can find the transcript of this podcast and any links mentioned on our podcast page at voxgig.com slash podcast. Subscribe for weekly editions where we talk to the people who make the developer community work. For even more, read our newsletter. You can subscribe at voxgig.com slash newsletter, or follow our Twitter at voxgig. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time.